Gaston. Oh, oh, sure, yeah. Well, that's uh, east of uh, east of Richmond, it's out near Bird Airport. Chalice yeah, I Lane. think uh, Richmond Lane. was where a great many of them lived, or in that vicinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And we got speed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Phyllis, uh, tell me about uh, uh, this period in uh, 1947 during the summer when you came to see your father uh, at Roswell. What, what, what did your father do in Roswell? My father was the sheriff of Chester County, and uh, um, they lived in the, the uh, courthouse. The jail and the sheriff's quarters were in the same building, and so they lived on the downstairs floor, and then um, downstairs was an office <coughs> with two rooms, and uh, the uh, the jail was upstairs, and prisoners were taken into the office, and then up the steps to the jail. And what, were, were you living with your folks in 1947? No, I wasn't living with them. I was there visiting. Uh -huh. uh, I, uh, uh, my husband and I were both students after World War II in Las Vegas, New Mexico, in uh, Highlands University. And, uh, we were there several years after World War II to finish up our degrees, which we had started before the war. Mm -hmm. Our education had been interrupted by World War II. Yeah. <clears throat> so we went back. But I sometimes did not go quite as much because I had a young son. And uh, uh, he liked to stay with my mother. <laughs> and if I was busy going to school, and we also went to business and we worked in it and so uh, he'd stay there and probably he'd been there for a while or I don't know whether at that point in time I was actually in school or just going back and forth and, and staying up there a while and staying in Russell for a while. So you came to visit your father at his office one day in July, we think? <laughs> yes, I came to, I, uh, I uh, was reading the, uh, you could just walk into his office from the sheriff's quarters. And uh, I, the paper came out with this, and I did read the paper. What do you remember about what the paper said? Uh, about the headlines and the, the flying saucer sound. And uh, I don't remember whether he told me about it before then or not. I don't know. <coughs> but I did was so interested and I, in some way inside of me and I loved it and I wanted it to be true and uh, I went in to talk to him about it and sometimes I talked to him in the kitchen or something but I went into the office and talked to him about it and he was getting all these phones he had I remember he came into the kitchen and told about that he'd been up all night with the phone calls and that he had just talked to London England that he was there inside about that well, the distance and the times, you know, it's not the same as faxing something or sending it long distance now like we... The world was a lot bigger back then. Yes, right? it was. Yeah. So, um, and the, you know, another thing about the world then, uh, World War, they hadn't really rebuilt things that we, all the things hadn't been rebuilt in World War II. Now, in America, I know we weren't bombed, but we didn't have any, <coughs> they didn't build any washing machines, they didn't build any new cars, they didn't build anything, dryers, they, nothing, because they spent all their time on the uh, military and uh, weapons and those things. So there were no, so we had to wait a while to get a car, and we had to wait a while to get a washing machine so they just went on the market. So you've read about this flying saucer incident in the, in the newspaper, and you went in and talked to your father about it. Asked him about it, and uh, what did he tell you? And um, I asked him, um, "Do you think this is true?" And uh, he said, "I don't know why Brazel would have come all the way in here and brought that stuff if it hadn't been something important, and that he didn't, that he it had to be something that he." 
and he had sent deputies out to see about it. And uh, he was, he thought, I, he, so originally he thought it was true, but he didn't have any information. He was trying to send the deputies to get some more information. <coughs> and by this, the, but the first thing he did was call the Air Force because that seemed to be important to him. And he, I, he, I said, why did you call them? And he said, because I have an agreement with them that if any airman is in trouble in Roswell, any kind of problem about any uh, airplane or flight or anything like that, I call them immediately. We don't have room in our jail for those, and they come and take care of them. We just keep them a little while. They just held them until the MPs got there, and uh, the flight was same, and he felt that this had something to do with the Air Force or the, that was their business. He felt that was their what happened? Did he say and he when sent the, the deputies And he out? sent the deputies out. And <clears throat> I think I'm of the opinion that he sent the deputies out once and that they um, saw a large um, black area, blackened area, the grass, the range land and that they came back because it was dark. And then when he, when they came back, he had to wait till the next day to send them back again to find something else. And when they went back again, uh, the army had blocked it off and would, didn't let them in. And I'm talking about the army, of course, as we clarified yesterday, but it was called the army then. And see, uh, I think Brazel told them how to get there, but didn't, but they, you know, there's a long distance between Roswell and, and uh, Corona. You can't send somebody uh, out and have them search over a large ranch or look for anything in, in a half a day, really. I don't know what time they went, but Right. So the deputies were turned away by the uh, Army Air Force. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I think it was in the next day that the Army Air Force all came to the office, and uh, my sister came in. And what happened when you got to your father's yeah. office? Was the uh, we uh, we come in, and we had a small child, and Roswell was the shopping place for us to come and buy groceries. And once a week. And when we arrived, why, uh, I noticed that there were jeeps and some people, you know, from the Air Force there. And, uh, of course, I went right in with my small child, and my husband, Jay, went into the office, and he said to my father, what's going on, George? And he said, well, we've had a man come in uh, saying that there is a fine saucer and bringing a piece of things and said, uh, I don't know what it is and said we we're investigating it and uh, he said uh, what was it and he said well uh, it looked like a burnt grass looked like burnt grass out there and my husband came back into the office I mean back into the kitchen my mother prepared the meals for the prisoners and we were in the kitchen and uh, we didn't discuss it anymore or anything and uh, as the years went along, Mother would say, oh, remember the time when we had the flying saucer in Roswell and the uh, papers were out and uh, where I live, I'm very isolated. I, don't, uh, I go 20 miles for my mail one way and 20 miles back, so I'm not accustomed to getting a newspaper very often. <laughs> and I had no telephone, I had no electricity at that time because we're, so, we're in the rural. So it was another week, see, then, before I probably went back to town and knew anything too particular about it because I didn't stay all night. I went in and turned around and came back because we had milk cows that you have to get home to uh, at night. So I really was not uh, as familiar with it as Phyllis because she was staying all night there because she was, had, uh, was going to school up in Las Vegas. And 
But as the years went along, Mother would always say, and I also know of an article that she wrote that said, uh, we do not, as to this day, know that there, whether it was a flying saucer or what, because they told us, my husband, Mr. Wilcox, that she would say, don't you say a word. So he didn't, and he was very calm about it. I mean, he just didn't say anything. Who told him not to say a word? Uh, the Air Force did. When they came and picked up the piece or whatever they did, she said they uh, recommended him. That's what the words were in the little article she wrote. And uh, I had it because she wrote a, a great deal and she wrote an article on their four years at the county jail. They were not in the county jail, but that's what she said, four years in the county jail. But they were there as uh, working people in the jail. And uh, so on the very back page of her uh, article, she wrote uh, the day the flying saucer was in Roswell, New Mexico. Do you remember what that date, what she said that date was? Yeah, the date was not on the uh, paper. That's the reason I don't. And uh, uh, she said in 19, uh, on the outside of this uh, article, said, I uh, sent this article to the Reader's Digest in 1980. See, she had typed it over. And she had a whole bunch of typewritten uh, things. And, uh, but they did not accept it. That was written on the outside. She also said that she, uh, I don't know whether she took the article or she spoke to the Historical Society in Roswell. It said, uh, his, Roswell Historical Society in Roswell, New Mexico on, in 1980. So she might have taken the article over to the Historical Society, I do not know. Did your father describe to either of you what this material that Mac Brazell brought in looked like? He did not to me. He, he said, um, he brought some material with him, and, and some junk, like, I don't know what it is. That's the best I can do about what his words were. Right. Just about three mm -hmm. And uh, about the Air Force warning, there also, uh, my mother had written on there, this is a real and true story. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <coughs> she had spoken about it some after, you know, that, and I think, uh, and. Uh, she had talked to different members of the family that that there was a, a, a crash and there were bodies and but that they could not say anything about it. She so told my daughter. She I had told people, and I think maybe I had one conversation with her about it, but I can't, could not recall it as well enough. To know. But she talked about bodies. Yes. That had, that she had heard that there were bodies recovered. Yeah. Um, what about Mac Frizzell? What happened to him during this period of time? Well, the Air Force took him right away, and and uh, he really never came back to the sheriff's office. And the material was left there, and the Air Force picked it up and, and took it away. And that and and then that was the end of it. And uh, my father said, I said, well, what are you telling the people on the telephone? He said, I don't have any information. I have to tell them. I don't know that it is a size. I don't really know. I, ha I haven't seen it. I can't get in there. And, and the, the Air Force is handling it. And I'm referring calls to the Air Force. Well, that's right. He but said, just, I they didn't even answer, I don't think, out there, according to some of the witnesses here. He said that he had had calls from all over, from uh, England, uh, Germany. I believe, I can't imagine. She wrote it in this article, the name of the place where they had the calls from that morning when we got to town. And uh, it was quite exciting, and rushing around there a little bit, but uh, we did, uh, uh, just didn't go in, I just didn't go in the office. I just uh, stayed back in the kitchen with Mother, and then she told us what my father said, but she said that he was not to say one word, and she didn't say anything either for years and years. Yes, I'm not talking about yeah. years. Years. Yeah. Now, now see, it is four years in the county jail, so she had to write this article after uh, 1951. So, since she usually wrote, 
things down sometimes fairly soon after they happen. Yeah, so I'm forget. guessing it's been in the 50s, 55 that she wrote it. But we don't have any, um, I, we don't have any date, mm -hmm. we don't have any proof. I'm well, guessing the fi late 50s too myself. That's just what we had talked about guessing it to be. Late 50s or late 40s? Oh, well, well see, you see, this happened in 47, okay. and then they were still in the sheriff's office until, I believe it was 49, it may have been, uh, okay, so we're just adding some years onto that and right. saying that, that's, the title of the article is four years in the county jail, right. so they had to be out there. So the only question really is, when did your mother write the article, well, not I when think, this incident happened? Well, I know that, and yeah, we're right. trying to say right. we think that it was in the, in the 50s. 50s. We think it was in the My 50s. father became very ill right after he came out of the sheriff's office. Uh -huh. And she was traveling around trying to find the best doctors and everything in the world to help him. And they, she was very, very busy. And she had not started a business or had anything, you know, because she had just come out of this job. And he didn't have a job. So then she became a real estate agent in Roswell. And she did the work. And my father then passed on. And uh, he died. In Oh, we, 58, we had 58. No, it was the 60. We decided. <laughs> we I think decided. the other day it was 62. We <laughs> yeah, we're pretty close to that. Uh, uh -huh. What did you all hear about uh, Mac Brazell's uh, being detained by the Army Air Force? I didn't hear. Phillips, did you? Well, I don't know when I heard it. I I know he was detained by the Army Air Force, uh -huh. and I know he was out there. But after all, you know, we had just been through all this business here, plus we had been interviewed before, plus I had read the Roswell incident, the MJ-12, listened to Stan Friedman talk. Um, <laughs> okay. So, and, a lot uh, of so stuff. I have, yeah, in, in the last two years. You're not, uh, when I heard so you say I, you're not absolutely sure what you knew, when you knew it. Uh, this is true. I don't know what I knew about Russell until after I read the book and after. Uh, but but when I when I talked to my father, he said, I don't know why Brazel would have brought that stuff in. And uh, some way he indicated that he trusted uh, Brazel. And uh, probably because he was New Mexico Ranch, came all the way trying to tell somebody, mm -hmm. you know, I found something unusual. Mm -hmm. And so I think I did get that impression mm -hmm. then. I know I did. But when what else I know about Brazel's internment, I, I know nothing. Would your father have known a weather balloon if, uh, if that's what, what it was? Did he recognize one? Oh, well, I think so. Oh, yes, yes, we I found all of them. On our ranch, uh, uh, they're little square boxes. and. Uh, you can, uh, the balloon just, just deflates it's just, and you pick them up. Uh, there's been a number of them. You, they have a place that you can send them back to back, the yeah. Air Force and but they're father do said, that now. He, as far as he was concerned, from what you know, that this was not a weather balloon? Oh, no, I don't think he thought that. Well, they said it was a, no, I don't think brought so. a piece of, of a saucer in or a piece of metal or whatever it was. They had the metal no in that office, in the small office over there with the door shut. Nobody went in there. Locked. And the Air Force picked it up uh -huh. and from took your it. father's office. Yes. yes, and took it and said, "Don't you say another word about this." They had a little meeting in there when they picked it up, and that's they had all the jeeps. And they, like you, they said there was probably three people. Mm -hmm. But the I didn't see them. I don't know who they were either. I wouldn't have known. Did you saw. see them a little bit? No, I didn't. I just saw the military yeah. uh, jeep. You know how a jeep drives up in front if you. Uh, have something there were open jeeps and it was hot weather and they just there were two they got out and, and came in the office and that's all the I same, know. Besides curious. that I did not go in there unless it wasn't busy. You know, I didn't go in <laughs> and stand and listen to anything sure. that was not my business. Sure. You know my husband went in there and visited all the time because he was a man. Yeah. Women and, wouldn't go in there. And, and mine did too I'm sure. But I just uh, you know, I went only when he was by himself or when I really Exactly. Did your father ever name any of the military people who were involved with taking this 
Terry out of his office? No, not to me either. What happened after the Air Force said this was a weather balloon, as far as the calls? Well, then they just uh, went down because they, uh, the Air Force says it's a weather balloon and it becomes a weather balloon. Right. <laughs> Everybody just accepted that. That's right. They, 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 may knew, they may have known, and, and I, I remember distinctly thinking, this isn't right, I don't believe this, but, you know, you're busy and you're alive, and what do you, you know, I didn't dream, I never had an idea about investigating anything mm -hmm. like you've got. Doesn't sound like your mother was convinced. No, no she, was. she was not. No, no, no I think she knew very, that. Very, very brilliant, and she was... Uh, she had. Uh, she didn't have all of the responsibility my father had with all the prisoners and all the deputies and all of the uh, jail and all of the thing. And so she began to be real curious. But she said her. He told her the story, and then she kept it as long as she possibly could. And then she thought, well, she could tell our children because there it would be her grandchildren. And so uh -huh. she had talked to them and uh, uh, you know, kind of come forth. But you can't. Uh, uh, if they say don't say anything, and you live right there in a the military town, and it was very important to Roswell at that base there. Really, it was uh, important, and they were in the public eye. Why, you conform to things. It's not that you're put in prison or you're that, but it's just a part of uh, nature that you do it. Just, uh, Someone asks you not to do something, and you say you, yes, we I'm do not. what we can for our country, and you just do that. They were, yeah. thought it seemed important, and a yeah. lot of people felt that the Air Force was doing experiments, mm -hmm. and that this was some new experiment that they were doing, and that well, it would be harmful to their uh, new uh, experiments if you told what they were. Some other country might get the plans, you know, or some kind of thing like that. So. If they were doing experiments with things, then I think that I thought that that was a problem. We were all so patriotic. Everybody was doing their job, and they would not tell anything because a war is a war, you know. And you believe that you should uh, be very patriotic. Now, both our husbands were in the service, and uh, we knew what that was. It's funny to have them be in uh, combat. <laughs> and you both live around Roswell today. Yes. What, what would you say is the sense of the, of the community there about now, 43 years later? Entirely what? different. A lot of people ask me about it, and uh, uh, a couple of my friends bought me the wrong one, yeah. and um, I have several people in, that have stopped me and asked me questions about it. And uh, I have a couple of uh, one woman's two grown sons that live in California and they're very interested in this and I see them every once in a while when they come to see their mother and they told me that one of them told me that he thought they were building some material that was similar to the um, material that they found that they found out on Brazos Ranch and he said I think that they have almost duplicated that and it's going to go on the market. Oh. And we talk about things like that. I talk about it with several people in, in, in that area. And they believe it. And the mother worked at the base at the time, and she just says, I believe this. Believe what? That there was a flying saucer. Yes. And that the other did too, because <laughs> she called it a flying saucer and wrote about it. So That's what this did. lady does. She's a little older uh, woman, but. Uh, she said, I believe, she worked for the base at the time. She's right. long been retired, but and she lives in a rest home in Roswell, but she's got her dreams. Now, if we were to take an opinion poll in Roswell, uh, that community, what do you think, and then the question was, do you believe a flying saucer crashed here in 1947? Mm -hmm. What would be the results of that poll, do you think? I think that would be uh, at least, uh, I think at least half of them. But now, see, that's the old timers, too, and we have a lot of new influx of newer people there because it, when we're talking about Roswell in 1947, we think, Elizabeth and I think, about 15,000 is probably what it was, and now it's 40 to 50. And they came back shooting. from the Air Force and retired there. They liked it so well. Mm -hmm. I had friends that were uh, 
and had gone to Germany and Lieutenant Colonels and came back to Roswell and retired. These lots of people retired. They're not natives like uh, we are. So now we have to take so those into consideration if you're talking about the majority of them that live there right now. But the people who lived there then, mm -hmm. okay, let's say that. You think most of them? No, think and I think that it's 60 percent. I, I have, uh, when I got here, I arrived and I, there was a friend of mine who uh, had a daughter who's just moved up here, so I gave her a call. And I said, uh, Alice, I'm here. She said, oh, what are you doing up here? And I said, well, I came to uh, kind of a convention for uh, UFOs or flying saucers, just in that conversation that was something at Roswell. And she said, oh, yes, I remember about that one. And I, I haven't seen, uh, she is, uh, she's been in Saudi Arabia, she's been in Sweden, she's been all over, and she's with oil, in the oil business, and they had moved up here, and I said, well, I'll give her a call. So the media, I said it to her, she had heard of it, because her mother and father probably told her, because she probably is in her 40s, so see, she would be someone that her mother would have to tell that, uh, about the flying saucer over Roswell, and she, they lived about 20 miles from me, but uh, that's neighbors. That's as close as mine gets. <laughs> well, I know you ladies have a boat yeah, ride to yeah, take, so you. I'm not uh, going to keep you any longer. Thank you. No, we appreciate I just, it. I just like to ask you as a, as a big picture of me, if you would mind reading over and signing this for me. Then you come in with your question. Exactly. Okay. Well, I'll just get you started. Just ask you what you were doing in 1947. How's that? Okay. Tom, we're ready to get Okay. Do you have any introduction? Nope. No introduction at all. We're just rolling the tape, and I'd just like to ask you what you were doing in 1947, around July. 1947, I was. Uh, at the air base in Roswell, I was in the military, and I was first lieutenant at the time. My assignments were three, <laughs> interestingly enough. Uh, I was assistant flying safety officer, I was assistant base operations officer, and I was assistant group operations officer. Now, the group was the 509th bomb group, and because of uh, the building I worked in, all three offices that I just told you about were contained in the same building. And uh, for a time, it seems, I was running back and forth. At that time, I was primarily in group operations. And the call came in one day to the range to have B-29 ready to go as soon as possible. Of course, someone asked, uh, where to? I said, just get a crew on board and uh, have the airplane stand by, and we're going to go to Fort Worth. And it was, that was Colonel Blanchard's directive. So I was out in the operations office. Uh, I have to explain to you, the building is an H-shaped building. And the, uh, the vertical part of the H is where the two hallways were one on each side, but the one on the right side uh, ran directly from the parking area out front and went straight through the building and out to the ramp for the aircraft. The cross of the H, half of it was the operations, base operations office, where the uh, base pilots came in, filled out their flight plan, and stepped to one side and obtained their weather briefing and read notices to airmen, and got all the material ready to go. And the flight clearance then was taken and submitted to the tower to let them know something was going to happen and uh, to air traffic control and so forth. As I explained last night, uh, trying or yesterday afternoon, late, trying to clarify a point, uh, each squadron also have their own operations set up and they could release their aircraft without going through base operations. 
they would let us know that a group was taking off and uh, just how many airplanes it were. But they had already handled all their uh, arrangements with air traffic control and with the tower and so forth. At any rate, I was in that operations office and Colonel Blanchard drove up and came in and asked, is the aircraft ready? And I and one other fellow there, who was now dead, uh, said, yes, it's sitting right out front, ready to go. And with this, he turned, stepped out in, back into the hallway and w waved to some people outdoors and still sitting in the automobiles. And uh, I suspect, trying to recall now, there were four or five or six people. And I'll say, I'll say five. It doesn't really matter. But uh, they came in the front door, straight down the hallway, and right out onto the ramp to climb into the airplane. And these were the people that were carrying parts of the crashed uh, flying saucer at that time, a UFO today, that uh, I got to see. And that was the only thing I got to see. And it was very short, very quick. The, uh, Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the uh, ops office. And I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see too. <laughs> maybe if I hadn't said that to him, made it obvious that I was there, uh, I would not have been shipped out two weeks later. <laughs> What was his immediate response to your request? Well, he just turned and, and if you knew Colonel Blanchard, and he, when he went on to become three-star general and vice chief of staff, uh, he was a very commanding presence. And uh, he, was a, he was a good officer, a, a real leader. And when he said he wanted something, people said, yes, sir. And, and it wasn't just because he was the military. So he just turned and looked at me, and he did turn sideways so that I could half step into the doorway and watch the fellows go through. And what I, thus I saw them carrying certain pieces of these metal items. And uh, as I've described to other people when asked, they, uh, they had one piece that was, oh, I like to say, uh, 18 by 24 inch or coffee table top size brushed stainless steel in color maybe if you think of the common aluminum foil roll today when you pull it out uh, one side's real reflective but that's not what it was it was the like the opposite side which is rather dull doesn't have great reflective power. And I've heard it mentioned now, of course, so many times about the uh, I-beam with the markings on it and so forth. And I actually saw that piece of I-beam being carried through and, and saw the markings. But it was a case of here it was and there it went. And, uh, Very quick. That was all I got to see. They went out, got on board the aircraft, went to Fort Worth, and uh, Major Marcel went with them. Of course. I mentioned the operational setup. This has has become clear in the discussion that uh, there was some confusion about what airplane went where. One of the first interviews I did, I. Uh, they asked me about a B-29, and I said, oh, there was a, there was a B-25 also. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple days later, we had occasion to set up a B-25 to take, do something and take something to Fort Worth. Then there was a third flight, and this was the B-29 that Pappy Henderson was the pilot, and he flew to Wright Patterson Field in Dayton, Ohio. Directly from Roswell. Yes. No stop off. No. I say that, not really knowing that answer, but 
going back to the time element involved, Every, I, I sensed the other day that everyone got the impression that uh, Major Marcel went out to the crash site, picked up this material, brought it on base, showed it to the colonel, and it was flown out. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Walter Haunt had made this paper, the newspaper release, public relations release, and within 12 hours, it was all squashed, and killed. And every, I, I picked up that everyone was thinking that everything went out on that flight, that they went to Fort Worth and then they went on to the right path. Mm -hmm. I'll have to jump now 40 years <laughs> Feel free. because uh, something that happened in our house was, was a couple we had in for dinner and I knew he was a mortician and retired. On the 40th anniversary, the local paper in Roswell reprinted the story of the flying saucer and uh, the pictures or the sketches. So, and they had a couple sketches of what the aliens were supposed to look like, these alien bodies that were claimed to have been found. As we were walking to the front door down our hallway, this fellow turned to me and said, did you see yesterday's paper? And, I, and the article on the, the Roswell incident, I said, yes, I did. And shock number one comes when he said, that's what they look like. Thus we stop and talk a little bit, and I come to find out, and he has since been interviewed by Stamp and Friedman. He was a mortician on duty that received a phone call from the airbase asking for child-sized caskets and body bags that night. Or say the night after the first airplane flew out. <coughs> It develops that this individual uh, was driving an ambulance for the mortuary, which was a service they provided the Air Force, and he had gone to pick up a, a sick airman in town and took him to the base hospital. Now this is the next night, 24 hours later. and. He said, I'll go over and see my girlfriend. And it happens that the nurse who handled the bodies was his, was his girlfriend. They had even been thinking about getting married. I don't recall her last name. Her first name was Naomi. He walked into her lab area and was immediately stopped by air police <laughs> and uh, escorted out. Before he was actually taken out, uh, she looked up and said, I will call you later. And because they said, where are you going? Well, I'm going to see my girlfriend, Lieutenant Thompson. Out. They took him out. Later they did meet, as he told me, and uh, she sketched on a prescription pad what the aliens looked like. And he had that uh, sketch and, and took it back to the mortuary and put it in a file in the drawer of his desk where he had a series of files on the work that he handled. And there was all the records they were keeping. He delivered so many caskets or he picked up so many airmen and took them to the hospital and so forth. Stanton Friedman interviewed this individual and they arranged to go to the uh, file building that the mortuary still maintains. And they found all of the files, of manila folders and so forth, that he had had in his desk during the years he worked there, except that one file with the sketches in it and any remarks. That had been 
picked up sometime and taken. By whom, they don't know. But here again, the secrecy veil had come down. <laughs> you said you were shipped out shortly after this happened. Yes. Now, as I explained yesterday to the people to clarify this point of uh, the different flights, I sent, had learned, of course, that uh, the sergeant of the guard with a series of airmen went out and they surrounded the site and then they swept the area and picked up everything they could and the bodies were brought in and everything was laid out in Hangar 84. And what happened to them then? Well, as I was relating to the fellows, uh, the Air Force had established a system of, there was a base operations office for all normal activity and they controlled the weather station, they controlled the crash equipment, the tower operation that oversaw the control of the immediate area. Each squadron had its own contact and own operations and they could set up their own training flights, establish their own contact with air traffic control tell the tower that they were going to take off tomorrow at 10 a.m., the whole 12 airplanes or however many, and all they provided to the base was the fact that 12 airplanes are leaving tomorrow and they'll be gone on a, let's say, a 15-hour mission. And that's all we needed to know, speaking in terms of representing the, the group ops and the base ops. And one of the squadrons, this is about three days later now, or four days, announced a, a training flight and their aircraft all took off, let's say this morning, in the order that was prescribed and so forth. One of those aircraft was flown by Pappy Henderson, which had been loaded with all the material out of Hangar 84 and went to Wright Patterson. Including bodies? Yes. They were in the the caskets that this friend of mine had supplied from the mortuary. Did you see the caskets or the bodies? No, I didn't. How, how do you know that they were on that flight? Because that's when they got there. <laughs> uh, how do I know? I, I was told that that's what Pappy Henderson said he carried. He was in the hangar and, and saw this material and saw that his aircraft was loaded. It was years before he mentioned anything to anybody. At any rate, in other words, what I was trying to convey is everything did not go out with that first airplane. And when the next flights went, we can't find out today. There's no way of tying it down. They have an idea of when he arrived that's not important. The point is that once the secrecy veil dropped and Colonel Blanchard was informed and he informed his staff a day later, this, the official story is this was a weather balloon and that's it. Nothing further need be said. I ran into, uh, I, I don't call it a misunderstanding, a lack of understanding on the part of, of a couple investigative reporters who asked me a leading question and I turned and looked at them uh, like I'm looking at you and I said, how old are you? And they were rather startled, you know, he said, when were you born? Well, he, he was born around the time of the Korean War, 52, 51, 53, you know, different dates for different people. I said, all right. I said, your knowledge of war has been limited to the Vietnam situation and the confusion that was going on and the lack of support by people uh, for, the, for that war and, and really the confused way it was run by Washington uh, authorities. 
I said, never before in the history of, of uh, military operations has a, a national capital set back and told the people how many bombs they can drop tomorrow or how many shells they can fire in their gun. You know, this is a ridiculous way to run an operation. But back in, oh, the question had evolved because of Walter Hawk and myself, who knew each other at the airbase, knew of, who a year and a half later, or two years later, uh, shared an office for a year in town as civilians. He was running his little thing, and I was running my little operation. And uh, we cut expenses by sharing an office. And he had raised the question with Walter and then with me, how come you fellows never talk to each other? And Walter had made the remark, well, I guess I know what I know, and he knows what he knows, and that was it. Well, how come you didn't talk to each other? That's what I'm leading to, and why I asked him how old he was. I said, World War II, if you didn't experience it, it's very difficult to understand, but I said, Someone came up and slapped the collective nose of the country, and we fought back. And it was in the newspapers, it was in magazines, it was on the radio. Statements similar to, uh, loose lips sink ships. Remember, don't talk about anything. Don't let on you know anything, because someone's going to take the information and use it to your detriment. I said, college campuses got into it, but uh, not by using signs that said, uh, minefield, don't walk here, rather than keep off the grass. Okay. Newly seated areas, and they'd have it roped off and say, minefield, don't step here. Consequently, the, the entire country became, in a sense, brainwashed. Everyone was concerned with World War II. And I asked the question, did you realize ever, did you ever know that everyone on the coastline had blackout curtains on their windows and on their doors? And when someone rang the doorbell, they turned out the lights before they opened the door? And they said, no. I said, well, this is true, all the way down the eastern coast around Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. The theory being we shouldn't allow the enemy to to know where our cities were. Of course, now they could sit out there during the day and, and watch, and people in New Jersey could look out on the ocean and see tankers being blown up by torpedoes. This was taking place right out there. And well, this is the way we operated. You were told not to talk about anything. And then if you were in the military, it was even more emphasized. Consequently, Walter knew his, his thing, and I knew my thing, and we never talked about it. We had never talked to one another about the Roswell incident until after we were invited to come here. And suddenly we both. <laughs> what do you think? I guess we Correct. both felt we had to explain to each other what we did know. What do you think happened? What crashed in New Mexico in 1947? I think some type of craft of which we were not at all familiar uh, had a problem and did come apart and crashed in the desert area of New Mexico. I really do. As the properties of the material that was found was unknown to all our scientists. The bodies had never been, no one had ever been seen like that before if these sketches were true, and, and I feel they were. You knew this mortician pretty well, didn't you? Yes, it developed <laughs> that he and my wife went to school together, mm -hmm. and his wife and I knew each other through some friends from the moment I first went to, uh, to Roswell in 1945 to learn to fly the 29s And uh, 
we were very close friends and came close to marrying one another. Uh, you know, uh, and she as much as told that to my wife. <laughs> she says, but you got there first, to my wife Joanne. And uh, we've been close friends ever since, oh, all this time. Ever since the event took place, we knew each other. And we never talked about it. What happened to her, the nurse? The nurse? I've heard conflicting stories. I'll jump back to the time of just after the, the incident occurred. The airplanes have taken the parts and, and the body, excuse me. Uh, I was shipped out to the Philippines. How soon after? Two weeks, was it? Within two weeks. Mm -hmm. Was that was that unexpected? Well, it developed. It was unexpected. Uh, these things occurred off and on to people, but there was a telegram, uh, TWX, called the military, came in from Eighth Air Force that said, "Urgent need for one each." Flying safety officer, MOS number such and such, to report to Clark Field in the Philippines. And they turn around and, and uh, look. Well, I, I'm not even sure, but what it might have had my name on it, because I was the only weights and balance officer on that base. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was shipped out going to Clark Field in the Philippines uh, because of being weights and balance officer. I understand the nurse was shipped out the same week, the sergeant of the guard and the guards, all of them, who were surrounded the site, swept the area and picked the pieces up, they were all shipped out. And every one of us went to a different base someplace around the world so that no two of us were together. design do you think? Do oh yes, I believe it was by design because it takes, it, it's been looking back through the years and even at that time I s suspected something because I got to Clark Field and they didn't need a weights and balance officer. They had never asked for one. Well, I said, well, that's what this telegram says. And they said, we don't care what that says. We, we don't need one. We've got one. And uh, we don't need another one. And they said, uh, what else do you do? And I said, well, operations office. They said, all right, I'll assign you to squadron so-and-so as the operations officer. And that's where I, where I went. And uh, we were involved in photo, high altitude photo recon. And that's what I spent the time over there doing taking pictures from high altitude. Where was the nurse shipped out to? I understand she was shipped to Germany, and I understand that it was told that there was an airplane crash and she and a group of her nurses were all killed. The sergeant of the guards that surrounded the territory and picked up the material he lives in New Mexico, and I understand uh, just recently spoke to one of the reporters for the first time, but his information has not been released in any of the stories. I say that because the investigative reporter said, Bob, you just saw him, and uh, he has spoken to us for the first time since the event. Now, that was, where are we here? Well, that was nearly 43 years. Almost exactly 43 years. Yeah. And uh, he said, we're, since we're the first ones he's talked to, he said, we're not going to use any of his material at this point because we have to dovetail and collaborate and make sure we're... But he said, I am finding that what you said, talk, speaking to me, he says, what you have told us this evening 
just emphasizes and proves the point of what everyone else has said. This particular reporter, by the way, would come out of New York City and he said when he got the assignment, he was totally aghast that they would think of sending him out to, to research some unidentified flying object, which he didn't believe. <laughs> but he said, I had become convinced of being here. <laughs> and, uh, so roughly speaking, that's my story. It, uh, I saw a couple things. I was involved with scheduling an aircraft. I was shipped out with several other people all at about the same time. And uh, 40 years went by before uh, a best friend of mine uh, spoke up for the first time and said, I know something about that. Since that time, Stanton Friedman has interviewed the individual. I uh, took them, took Stanton up in the mountains to meet the man because Stanton didn't know whether he should go or not. This was rather interesting. As an aside, perhaps had nothing to do with the interview, but uh, I was talking to Stanton in his hotel room in Roswell and Stanton said, well, so-and-so has invited me up there for dinner tomorrow. Do you suppose I ought to go? It was kind of, so I, I can rent a car and drive up there if you think it'd be worthwhile. Then I said, Stan, knowing this individual, he's one of the good old boys. He speaks his piece. If he invited you to come up and have dinner with him, that means he wants you to come up and have dinner with him. <laughs> and, uh, it wasn't a polite thing he was doing. I said, it's an exceptional thing he's doing. Well, I went home and cleared the decks with my wife and called Stan back and said, uh, I'll take you up there tomorrow. This will help you and I'll introduce you. And so, so we did. They had a great interview and then we all went in to have dinner together and we continued the interview, clarifying some points for uh, Stanton. Since you and, and the mortician, your friend, both had a, an interest in the relationship with Naomi, the nurse, I, kind of, I have to ask what you think about what you were told about her having been killed in, in a plane accident. Um, well, do you my, accept my, that? Uh, my only thought was, uh, I had two thoughts about it. One is, Gosh, what a waste, because uh, when I was working in uh, there with, in group operations, the, uh, the colonel who sat in front of me, or, or I should say the colonel operations officer, <laughs> behind whom I sat with my desk, and uh, to my left was Major Woody Swanka, who uh, flew the bikini drop, And, and the colonel got an assignment to go overseas. And his airplane was reportedly blown up over the ocean. And he had nothing to do with uh, the Roswell incident because he was going overseas before the Roswell incident took place. And it was one of those things. The, the fellows are here today and, gosh, Fred, you're going where tomorrow? Oh, is that right, you know? You, you, your airplane goes down and you're lost. See? Well, there's another friend gone. And that's the way you thought about it. The second thing I, I thought of in regards to Naomi and the nurses was, of course, now I'm overseas. I learned this either while I was there or at, right after I got back, but. Uh, her airplane had been lost. So there's two possibilities. One it was the normal, natural thing of, of some kind of airplane being lost, because it does occur. Or, boy, is the government taking that extreme to control what she knows? <laughs> because she was the one who actually worked on the bodies. And, uh, 
other thing was that they had called this mortician asking him for information on taking care of the bodies because he had just newly returned from the, the school with the latest methods known at that time uh, on how to preserve the bodies and so and she had related to her what he knew and that she was trying to do that and uh, she had more first-hand information about the alien bodies than anyone else What about yourself? Do you have any concern? Uh, you're a former military man. Are you drawing a pension? No. no. So there's, there's not any direct hold the government has over you in terms of... Did, did you sign any kind of secrecy oath? No. Uh, I was not told to keep quiet. Uh, uh, some people were, mm -hmm. whom they felt had more information than than they knew I did. Right. right. <laughs> and uh, it's just that, as I learned, everyone was shipped out. Right. So that probably pretty much took care of it, I that suppose. That was the first initial attempt. <laughs> now, this mortician, for example, because of his involvement, he was visited. His mother and father were visited by military people, whether they were in uniform or, or in civilian dress, mm -hmm. and they were warned not to say anything to anybody about anything. Mm. Very direct. And once again, if, if I believe this man without fail. Mm. And uh, so some people were directly told, uh, others were just shipped out. I came back from overseas and learned that Walter Hawk had, had resigned his commission. And thus they left him alone. Walter, of course, uh, as you probably know, never did see any, he personally never saw any of the parts or pieces or what have you. He just happens to be the guy that wrote the release that stirred everything up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and again, it was on. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shirky. I appreciate your time. So, that's all I know. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Okay. <laughs> I still get tongue-tied and forget things. Uh, questions that I've answered 15, 20 times. Same question, but put just a little bit differently. Uh -huh. You have to shake your head and back off and uh, right. regroup. Yeah. Well, but I don't need to give you my standard lecture about I want you to be relaxed. It's just you and me talking. Just sort of ignore Tom and his camera. Uh, just pretend they're not here. And <coughs> I just want you to be as comfortable as possible. I do have a bad habit, and you may think I'm looking over the camera. I'll do that occasionally. I'll, you know, when I'm trying to think, I may sure. uh, I lose eye contact with you, and that not was just me. strictly. Uh, I want to break. I mean, just uh, that's a good excuse. I want to look away and see sure. if I can stop for a sure. tenth of a second. Okay. Tom, we rolling? Yes, we are. All right. Uh, Mr. Hogg, can you tell me about the day that Colonel Blanchard gave you a call and told you to put out a news release? What, uh, what was happening that day, as you as you recall, when that phone conversation took place? Basically, up until the time I got the phone call from, I sure can't tell you what was happening. It was probably a very routine day. Uh, I was doing either some public relations work, base housing, uh, or something else. I really, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was just the normal work day. Got the telephone call from Colonel Blanchard. And in essence, he told me that uh, we had, in, he had in his possession a flying saucer or parts thereof. Gave me a little bit of idea of where it came from and <clears throat> ranch north, west of Roswell. Then stated that uh, Major Marcel, Jesse Marcel, who was our base intelligence officer, was going to fly it to 
Fort Worth to turn it over to General Roger Ramey, who was commander, commanding general of the 8th Air Force at that time in Fort Worth. And what did Colonel Blanchard want you to do? He told me to prepare a release uh, with basically the information that he gave me over the phone when it was done to take it into community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time, which is what I did. Uh, as best you recall, would that uh, have happened, uh, initial phone conversation during the morning or in the afternoon? To the best of my remembrance, it would have been in the morning, and I would have to guess somewhere, I would guess around 9 o'clock. The only reason why I come up with that figure is that had to be done and gotten into town so that it would have gone to the uh, record in time for them to set it and to have gone ahead and run it in that day's evening paper. And would you know what day this happened? I would say the 8th of July, 1947. And that was the date of the Roswell Daily Record yes. article. Okay. What, uh, once you wrote up the news release, then what happened after that? As I said, I, I had to take it into town. Uh, he told me to take it in so that if there was any validity to the fact that this was a flying saucer, that and information got out to other news media other than our own, he felt that he wanted our people there in Roswell to have had first crack at it. Didn't want them to feel that he had given the information out to someone who got it to the uh, press services uh, outside of Roswell. So I took it into town and delivered it to the four news media in town, two radio stations and two newspapers. Do you happen to recall what your itinerary was, who you went to first, for example? I'm almost certain I went to radio station KGFL first, mm -hmm. uh, secondly to uh, KSWS, they were a half a block north, and then I took it to the uh, Daily Record, which was a block further north, and then on my way back out to the base, I dropped it off at the Morning Dispatch, which was about three blocks from the Daily Record. What, uh, what's your recollection about the reception initially when you handed out this news release at these various local outlets? Uh, did anybody read this material and respond immediately? I don't believe they did. Uh, I believe, again, you're going back some many, many years, I believe uh, the first place I went was to was at the KGFL, and I believe I just simply uh, left it on the desk of the receptionist. Best I recall, she was not there, and I, Frank Joyce, to the best of my memory, was in the studio, and he could see the reception area and also see out on the street. And I think I probably pointed at it. Uh, indicate that it was something for them. Uh, I don't remember what had happened at uh, KSWS. The record, I gave it to the editor because he sat close to the front door. Uh, probably said, hi Don, how are you, Dad? Might like to have this or, you know, very, uh, nothing fantastic, just uh, the normal routine, what I did when I brought him a uh, news release. And then I went down to the uh, dispatch. Again, I believe there I took it into uh, either the editor's office or the publisher's office. I knew both of them real well. And occasionally I'd stick my head in and shoot the breeze with the publisher. Uh, the actual delivering of it to who I gave it. It's, uh, I may have seen a half a dozen people in the different uh, news media offices and who I finally said, here it is. And, uh, 
it's kind of hard to differentiate from one to the other. Nothing real remarkable. Nothing. About that. Nobody said, "Oh wow," uh, you know. I just looked at it, almost put it down. And the way most journalists treat news releases. Right? That's right, and uh, this was not uh, something that was unusual because you walk into someone's office and say, "Here's a news release," which I had done many, many times, and nothing was uh, that hot that they had to grab it and run back and stop presses and that type of thing. So it was just a matter of just a, they took it and probably glanced at it and had a few words and I went my merry way. And what happened next after you had completed your appointed rounds? I returned to the base and when I got into my office the phone was ringing. I picked it up and the first call was from uh, London, England. I answered it. Answer the phone. That's how I found out it was from London, England, and some newsman over there. And his question was, "How did Major Marcel know how to fly this object?" I had, in the release, had stated that Major Marcel had flown the object to Fort Worth, meaning that he had put it on an aeroplane and got in and flew the aeroplane. It was a poor choice of words the way I put it. Uh, there were a tremendous number of calls of the same effect. Uh, if this was an unidentified flying object, how would we have someone within our Air Force that knew how to just get in there and flip switches and run controls? Some of them, uh, oh, some of them were rather terse. Is this another one of those? fly-by-night stories, uh, can you verify it? And the commanding officer is the one that stated that this is what we had. That was I, verification enough for you, wasn't For it? me, that was more than enough verification. When he said something, that was the law. Yeah. That went on continually. We had continual phone calls. I think my people that were working for me in the office uh, left somewhere around or so on. I left there, uh, I would guess, 7.30 to 8 o'clock. By that time, it, it tapered off completely, and I was spent the last half hour or so just looking over what had happened during the course of the day and beyond uh, the Roswell incident. Uh, the base didn't stop operating because uh, we found that so-called flying saucer. What happened the next day, as you recall? The only thing that happened of any import, as far as I was concerned, I believe I read it in the morning newspaper, or heard it on the news that General Ramey said that we didn't have a flying saucer, that that was a weather balloon, with which I just breathed a tremendous sigh of relief, and I think I turned to one of the people in the office and said, well, they sure made fools of us again. <laughs> I, then again, we fit into the category of hundreds of others that had said they saw uh, flying objects. So it was not uncommon uh, for people to think they had a flying object and then lo and behold, uh, it shot down. Beyond that, that was the end of it. Did you see <clears throat> any of this wreckage or any, any of the material? None whatsoever. Do you believe that Colonel Blanchard had seen it? Yes, I do. And why do you feel that way? Uh, I don't think he would have been so, uh, I don't want to say gung-ho, but I don't think he would have been so confident in his comment of, we have a flying saucer in our possession, or parts of a flying saucer. I don't, over this many years, I don't remember the exact verbiage, but uh, he wasn't overly excited. He wasn't flipping about it. It was just a normal, routine type of conversation that uh, we'd have when he'd call me and say he wants this done. But he sounded pretty positive about it. He sounded positive, yes. About what he had. Would you have any reason to believe that Colonel Blanchard would have mistaken this material for being any form of weather balloon or observation device? I don't think there's a one chance in a billion that 
he would not have recognized a weather balloon. Uh, he was not. He was a West Point graduate, class of '37, as best I recall. Uh, had gone up through from second lieutenant up to colonel. Not too many years. Uh, very intelligent individual. Uh, not the type to just jump off on tangents. I think he knew a weather balloon if he had seen it, and that would have been the end of that. He wouldn't have gone anywhere with it. He would have told uh, Major Marcel, uh, this is a weather balloon. Then again, Major Marcel would have known that it wasn't a weather balloon. That was my next question. Is it possible that Mar Major Marcel would have been misled? Or no. Mis is it possible that Major uh, Colonel Blanchard might have been misinformed by somebody who told them about, told him about what this wreckage was without having seen it for himself? I would doubt that very much. I don't think uh, he would have uh, taken the actions he did by taking, going down to operations with it. Uh, if he was there in the operations building, he certainly saw it. Uh, I'm sure that Major Marcel had talked to him and had given him some pretty sage advice as far as he was concerned. Um, the metallurgy of it. Uh, I don't know how much Jess Marcel knew about it, but he, again, was a very intelligent individual and not the type that would just jump at uh, anything and try to carry it to, to an end. And between the two of them, I'm certain that one or the other would have called the other one's hand if it uh, was a weather balloon. So what did you think when uh, General Ramey said it was a weather balloon? Do you believe that? Uh, we're in 1947. When the general said it was a weather balloon, it was a weather balloon. And it was a load off of our mind, uh, as, as far as I was concerned. When I said our mind, my office, the public relations office. Because you'd no longer be the focus of we world attention. We were out of it completely. You're just as happy that that was the case? Very much so. Uh, that was, as far as I was concerned, that was the end of the story. Uh, surprisingly, I used to see General, at that time, he became, had become a General uh, Blanchard. When he'd come into town, he'd call me and I'd go out and have breakfast with him or lunch. Uh, never a word was mentioned at any time during any of our conversations. Was that deliberate on your part? No. I had very frankly completely forgotten about it. And whether he had forgotten, I would doubt it very much. But he just never brought it up. Uh, did anything happen? Uh, did the colonel say anything about this incident shortly after General Ramey's statement? Perhaps in a staff meeting? In the next staff meeting, which was about a week later, I think we held him at that time every Monday, uh, he made some comments about our agenda and what we were going to talk about. I believe after those comments, he made some statement. He said, to the effect, we sure messed up on that one uh, last week. Matter of fact, he said, that outfit that was letting, sending those uh, weather balloons up were here on our station. They were from White Sands, and they were checking the upper atmosphere winds from east to west. And he, he sort of helped he, buttress the weather balloon right. theory. He, with that comment, we all, see, we knew it all along. You know, we were all real smart all of a sudden. We knew that it wasn't a flying saucer. Did you ever have a chance to talk with uh, Jesse Marcel? Not Captain? until about around 1980 next time I talked to uh, Jesse came to Roswell with Johnny Mann from a uh, TV station in uh, New Orleans. Uh -huh. He was taking uh, Mann out to the site to show him where it had happened. And, uh, he interviewed myself and had brought Jesse with him. And I spent an you know, hour and a half or two hours with
that kind of convinced me that uh, he was a neighbor of mine, a block down the street uh, in Roswell. And I had the highest regard for the man. He was a very fine individual. We were impressed with his son, who's now Dr. Marcel. Uh, he was quite a sharp little 11 year old, I believe he was 11 or 12, whatever it was. He, he was as sharp as a cracker, and I think he still is. What about uh, another uh, officer there on the base who worked with uh, Major Marcel, uh, Sheridan Cabot? Does that name ring a bell with you? The name, yes, uh, I'd heard it. Uh, he was. OSI or CIA or something. I had no association with him whatsoever at any time. Uh, I had, you asked this question in 1947 and he walked by, I could, I could have said that's him over there. Uh, that had been about the extent of it. Uh, had nothing to do with him in any way, matter, shape, or form. There's uh, been some talk about the circumstances under which you left the, uh, the Air Force. The suggestion was that somehow you were pressured into into leaving because of your involvement in the story and that sort of thing. Can you set it straight? Do you want a long story or a very short story? Well, let's, let's try the short version, then I could ask questions. Uh, at the time of the incident, we had a two-month-old daughter. We had built a house a couple months before. Uh, I was gone a lot of the time. I had about four different jobs. Uh, we were starting to wonder, well, I think my daughter at her age of two and a half or three months wondered what this was that came in the house every once in a while. My wife and I talked about it and talked about it. And quite a decision for us to have made, try to decide to stay in the service or get out. Well, we kicked this thing back and forth and back and forth and finally in February 1948 we decided that we'd stay in Roswell. I felt I knew enough people in business there that I could, if nothing else, I could get a job in Roswell. So I submitted my uh, letter of resignation. I was a regular Air Force officer. Uh, put on Colonel Blanchard's desk, April the 1st of 1948. On August the 18th of 1948, they got a Twix to, at the base. Started out with uh, First Lieutenant Walter G. Hawk, serial number 041123. And goes on and on and on and on and on. And it states that uh, relieved of all duties and assignments and all that. And it ends up Mr. Walter G. Hart's permanent address is 1405 West 7th Street, Roswell, New Mexico. I, I thought it was rather humorous. I start out as Lieutenant Hart up here, uh -huh. and it twitched that long uh -huh. at the bottom. I was no longer, I was Mr. Hart. Right. And, uh, it had nothing to do whatsoever with uh, the incident or anything else that had happened on the base. It was just a personal matter that my wife and I both felt uh, we'd like to raise our daughter in Roswell. A small enough community, good school system, everything else. Uh, maybe we shouldn't have been thinking that far ahead at that point in our life, but it was one of the things that we were taking into account. I was also probably going to be transferred to Fort Worth within a matter of four to six months. Uh, we didn't want to go to Fort Worth. We wanted to stay in the smaller community. Blanchard had told me that if I did go to Fort Worth that I would become public relations officer 8th Air Force. He transferred over there subsequently and became uh, operations officer of 8th Air Force. And from then on he started going up the ladder rapidly. He was rather well connected, wasn't he? Yes. His mentor was uh, General Curtis. I have to stop on that. I always want to say Curtis Easy LeMay. Uh, that was 
courtesy of Lemay. Mm -hmm. So as far as you're concerned, you could have stayed with the military and enjoyed a rather yeah. bright future. Yeah. No talk about your being shipped out after the... None whatsoever. Uh, things just went on the way they had been going on. Well, from not the day I arrived on the station, but uh, after we came back from uh, Bikini, where I had become public relations officer for the 509th Air Attack Unit, and when I came back to Roswell, Meitner made me the uh, group public relations officer and also base public relations officer. Do you have any regrets having been involved in this uh, incident? None whatsoever. I found it fascinating. Uh, I meet so many different people. 99% uh, are real nice, but once in a while that 1% always pops up and kind of squares you away and go on your merry way. It's been fun. In your heart of hearts, what do you think it was that uh, was in was on that ranch, Roswell, 43 years ago? Some type of craft from outer space, from where I do not know. Uh, I've talked to enough people uh, involved in it. I've talked well, I, such as Jesse. Marcel Sr. and Jr., uh, other people that had little uh, touch of it, Bob Shirky, who still lives in Roswell. Uh, everything I've heard from the investigators, uh, always, every time they come up with something new, I'm kind of, wow, that really is a surprise. That puts another uh, crown or star in the crown or whatever you want to say about uh, my feeling is that there's been so much that has been brought forward by legitimate people that there had to be something to it and apparently that is what it was it was something that crash landed out there in, on the desert I'm a firm believer can I get you to express your desire about what our government should do about this at this point Point in history? Well, I th very frankly, I think that the government ought to take all files that they have uh, on this subject and turn them over to a committee of legitimate ufologists, if you permit the use of that word, uh, whether they be uh, the ones that I'm familiar with or a panel of uh, scientists who are not negative, but will look at all the information uh, with an open mind and come up with a conclusion. I think that, uh, well, this is censorship, pure and simple. I, I don't like it. Uh, we want the right for people to walk the streets with placards and uh, protest. I wonder what would happen if a bunch of people started walking around the Pentagon or the archives carrying signs, we want the files. I don't think we'd get very far. <laughs> well, that's your right. Is there anything that, uh, that I've missed in, in, in all of this that you feel is important to, to add to this record that we're trying to, trying to put together? experiences that you've had, or any thoughts or concerns? Well, all my experiences with this have been extremely pleasant. I've met some of the nicest people. I've only had one experience. Uh, it was a telephone call from a fellow called and when I came, I was out of time when I came home, my wife said, the shadow called you. the shadow and the squeaking door. This fellow called me. He was a friend from my past. And he spoke in this very low voice and very slowly, uh, telling me that I was going to be in trouble. Uh, I should forget this whole thing. He told me all about how 
the materials were found and they were put on uh, freight cars and shipped from one place to the next. And my recollection of that is real vivid, primarily because it was I was trying to talk to this fellow and keep a straight face. My wife kept walking near me. <laughs> I thought that was one of the funny ones. He told her uh, when she first talked to him that morning, uh, he said something to the effect, well, what do you think about the UFOs? Oh, I think it's a lot of fun. So there's nothing funny about it. <laughs> the guy was really uh, kind of a crank. Phone call, but Do you know who this was? No. Yeah. Uh, I tried everything I could to trick him in to give me some clue that I know him at the base, that I know him from where. Uh -huh. uh, he just didn't stop by and he kept on not threatening me, warning me uh -huh. uh, about the dire consequences if I kept on talking about these UFOs. Uh, we still laugh about it. The rest of the people have just, everybody's been uh, extremely gracious. They're very uh, knowledgeable people. Once in a while you get someone who asks a question that kind of throws you off in the corner, but uh, I've tried to answer everything as honestly as I can, and I've had no trouble with anybody. I try to keep my story straight. Well, let me change on that. I try to keep my story simple so that it'll be straight and I don't have to cover anything up. That's about it. But enough of that, hasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Tell you what, we'll let you get back to the meeting. I'll walk you down there. Oh, before I let you go.